putting this on Zoom so that if we have any technical difficulties, oh, those blinds look, that looks great. Okay. That looks perfect. So if we have any technical difficulties, then it'll all be recorded and we can still post it on social media and stuff like that. So um, perfect. It's, we're going to, um, I'm going to end right around 29 minutes okay. because the Facebook algorithm, if I can get it under 30 minutes, then it pushes it out to more people <laughs> on their time. Perfect. Okay. So, um, 30 seconds. We have 30 seconds. Um, I'm going to say like, welcome to everybody and, you know, super informal and, you know, conversational. So and I'll just, I'll guide it. It'll be no big deal. Great, great. Of course I'm nervous. <laughs> oh my gosh, I told Chris, Jackie's so eloquent and articulate. This will be beautiful. Oh, okay. Beautiful conversation. Chris, hold that thought. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we've got 10 seconds and then we're going to go live. Five, four. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Here we are live on Facebook. Jackie, hi, thank you for being here. So glad to be here with you, Lindsay, thank you. Yeah, well, welcome everyone who's uh, tuning in to us live. I um, am really excited to be able to have um, what I believe will be a very deeply meaningful conversation with uh, the director of the Multicultural Family Center here in Dubuque, Jacqueline Hunter. And um, Jacqueline's work uh, within our community is extensive and her impact is both great and deep and um, you know she'll get a chance to tell you a little bit about her work but today we're talking about um, COVID-19 and the disproportionate impact that the coronavirus has had on our minority communities. We're seeing through statistics not just here in Iowa but throughout the country that um, our minority communities are getting hit um, with COVID-19 um, realities at a much greater degree. And so we wanted to um, have a, you know, conversation about uh, why this is and trying to wrestle out, um, you know, how we can actually help um, resolve this situation as we're all trying to, you know, find our way through this complex situation. So if you are joining us live, why don't you just, you know, say hello in the comment section, say you're watching. Um, and I am going to do my best to take questions throughout this conversation. Um, and so feel free to type in any questions that come to mind and we'll work to answer those um, as we have a conversation with Jackie. So Jackie, thank you again. Thank you. Yeah. Glad to be here. Yeah, good. Well, we have, oh, I see here, Supervisor Ann McDonough just uh, popped on. Oh, Susie Gassman says hello to you, Jackie. <laughs> <laughs> All of my favorite people. <laughs> yes. I'm sure people are going to just continue to pop on as we have this conversation. So welcome if you're just joining no us live. No um, we're here with the director of the Multicultural Family Center in Dubuque, Iowa, Jacqueline Hunter. And oh, Collins just popped on. Hi, Collins. <laughs> Lots of people, oh, hello, look at all these people jumping on. Glad you're here, um, but especially glad you're here with us, Jackie. So I wanna jump into, um, because we only have a short amount of time, I wanna just kind of dive right into the conversation. Before we kind of enter into the COVID conversation though, I would love for you to tell um, the people who are watching online a little bit about your story um, and how that informs your work at the Multicultural Family Center here in Dubuque. Of course. So I will have been in Dubuque uh, two years in October. Um, I moved from Florida um, to the Midwest for work. Uh, I have worked with basically family and youth populations for the last 25 plus years of my life, um, either in leisure services or I'm um, in education as a high school teacher and, and here in Dubuque actually as an adjunct um, history professor at Divine Word. Uh, I also served in the military as a, a military police officer um, in the Army. My work has always been with communities that have dealt with challenges. Um, and when I took the position with the Multicultural Family Center, um, a lot of the work, of course, is focused on, you know, special events and, and I would say the fun activities. We, you know, 
we use the, the mantra that we celebrate to educate. Um, but we also, that work entails a lot of us looking at some of the disparities and challenges within the debut community and how we can address them. Uh, much of my work there has focused on youth and making sure that we are providing opportunities um, for growth for the young people that we serve, particularly in the, the downtown um, Dubuque area. That's great. Uh, can you, you know, um, you know, you mentioned that you primarily serve youth and, and families. What, for those of you who are watching online who are unaware of this incredible resource, which is the Multicultural Family Center here in Dubuque, can you explain to our viewers what that is? An amazing place. Um, I actually contacted the MFC before I relocated to the Midwest. I was living in Platteville and I was looking for a place that would kind of give me um, some semblance of home. And so I don't even know how I did. I remember sitting in my home in Florida and um, the MFC came up and I contacted the director at the time. Um, Muhammad said I'm relocating with my family I'm looking for opportunities to engage my my children um, and our family in activities uh, the first event that I attended was the Marshallese Constitution Day I remember googling that in the car because I had not heard of the Marshallese people um, and so during the time that I was in Platteville um, we came to Dubuque often and participated in MFC activities so it was near and dear to my heart long before I knew that I would become part of um, such an amazing team of, of people there. Uh, but the MFC is, is committed to work that improves the community. Um, we look at everyone's contribution as being part of the fabric that makes Dubuque um, a beautiful and, and wonderful and embracing space. And we do that, again, through our cultural events and what we are able to provide. Um, and we do a lot of partnerships. We could not exist as an organization without the rich partnerships that we have in the community, um, as well as the committees who come together to make sure that we're able to put on these special events. Um, in addition, a lot of our work is also focused on, again, families and communities and what we can do to enrich the lives of all members of the Dubuque community. Well, I have to say it is a very special place and a lot of that has to do with you and the work that you do and your team. It's a, you know, incredible work you do. So thank you for all of it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Let's jump in. Um, there racial and ethnic minorities um, are testing positive for coronavirus at a disproportionately high rate here in Iowa. Let's talk about that. Can you tell me why you think that is? So um, one of the authors in the uh, Des Moines Register said it's the perfect storm. And this is a perfect storm of the inequities that have always unfortunately existed in black, brown, and, and even poor communities. Um, access to health care, um, you know, that is crucial. We talk often here in Dubuque about uh, the food deserts that we have and having access to healthy foods. Um, and so these things that we have, um, I won't say we've ignored, but maybe didn't come to our attention and, and we could kind of put it on the back burner as something that that organization would address has now hit us. And we're realizing that we have a serious um, issue on our hand. Um, and the health disparities, of course, uh, people particularly who live poverty, no matter what their ethnic background is, maybe don't have the um, opportunity for social distancing in the way that others would have. Um, you tend to find uh, people that live in poverty also living in very densely. Um, I mean, even inside my home, there are quite a few um, apartments. You have four different families in a building that's almost the size of my home. Um, and so the kids, where they can go. There are no backyards. I live against the bluff. So you, they don't have a backyard. They have the street that sits in front of them. So those kids are playing. If they're playing, they're playing on the sidewalk. Um, we have parks that are nearby, but you know, not having access to the playgrounds, um, again, makes it so that they're probably staying closer to home. And so we can see even, again, when I walk out my, my front door, what how different social distancing would look here as in other areas of the community where, you know, homes are spread a little more um, apart and what that would look like. Yeah. Um, you know, having more people household is certainly uh, affecting how we um, 
serve. And then we do see, again, multiple family units, particularly in the downtown areas of Dubuque. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and a lot of um, minority communities are serving in essential working jobs as well. Um, that is the other impactful area. Um, many of the families that we see, we've continued to do teen nights and, and to um, be engaged with particularly our younger people. And those parents are still having to go to work. Um, and it's interesting because I, you know, I look at the people that we have probably discarded in our communities. Um, discarded might not be the right choice of words. People that we have not been as mindful of their conditions are the people that are doing the real work right now. They are those frontline people. They are the working in the restaurants, um, delivering meals, um, you know, transportation, all of those things. And it's interesting because, the, again, the very ones that we probably have ignored for so long are the ones that are keeping us, keeping our head above water right now. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's been um, amazing having conversations um, through these Facebook uh, live streaming experiences. We just had on uh, Representative Ross Smith uh, a couple days ago um, talking about um, the migrant communities and the outbreak in Waterloo at the Tyson plant. And, you know, and he talked about as well the, um, you know, that there is disproportionately high rates of migrant community working in, in our, you know, meat packing plants, which is a huge source. Um, we have CNAs in nursing homes and, you know, but you named, I think, some really important, made some really important observations that, you know, the housing is um, an issue, access to healthcare is an issue. Anytime you are struggling financially, regardless of your ethnicity, health, just, you know, systemic health issues. Um, and it is, it, you know, I agree with the register's observation of, you know, language around the perfect storm um, and how that's hitting um, our communities. So thank you for those observations and in particular about uh, Dubuque and what's going on here locally. Um, I wanna ask you, Jackie, what do you want people to know? And this is, I mean, this is a hard question to kind of unpack. What do you want people to know about being a, Dubuque, who's a person of color, um, as we're going through this time of COVID-19, what do you want people to know? Uh, I think one of the most important things I think for people to understand about the Black community is that we internalize the struggles of other Black communities. We don't have to live there. We don't have to know the people. Um, so when the issue with COVID came out, First of all, that was already sitting on top of a bunch of other uh, negative statistics for our community. Um, and, and so it was probably a moment where we all had to say, you've got to be kidding me, like not again, not something else on top of the things that we deal with. Um, we internalize those anxieties and those tragedies and those struggles and whether something is happening um, in our local community, nationally, even internationally with this virus, again, we internalize that and what that means. And so I'm not good if my community isn't good. Um, some of the initiatives that I did even within my own home was because whereas I had a job and, and food was plentiful in my home, that wasn't the case for my neighbors. Where my kids had resources of having laptops and the internet, that wasn't the case for um, my neighbor's children. And so as I gathered school supplies for my children, it was like, how do we get school supplies to other kids? If my kids are able to eat, how do we make sure that other families in the community um, eat? And so, again, when things are happening, um, understand that the impact of this virus, again, is, is far reaching um, and what that will mean like. And, and we are worried. Many of, you know, in my family, everyone is unemployed at this point. Um, so I do worry about what this means for my cousins, my aunt, my mother who isn't working, um, my daughter who actually is visiting um, right now from Florida because she doesn't have uh, even the means to provide for herself without probably the assistance of her father and I. So again, I need people to understand that it's not just us that we're concerned about in terms of the well-being. Right, right, right. Well, and you are mom and, you know, to many kids in our 
in our city here through your role at the MFC um, and incredible support to them. Um, how are you seeing our kids impacted by this? You know, how are they investing? You know, you talked about helping, you know, the kids who need food, find food, helping the kids who need access to technology for the schools, get that. What are our kids going through right now? Can't go to playgrounds. I mean, what are they going through and, you know, how are, what are their needs? That for me is my biggest concern. Um, you have to understand that black and brown communities in Dubuque were already struggling with some issues. Uh, the digital divide, it really showed itself um, when school let out. For our children that were receiving um, brain health support, that were receiving additional educational support in the schools, that diminished for many of them um, to probably little to, no to nothing. Um, we also, again, not having some of those outlets that you may find in more affluent families, you know, regardless of race, that is not an option. I used to, um, I shouldn't say used to, I'm really bothered sometimes when I see the comments locally about kids being outside or not social distancing without us taking into consideration what else may be going on. Um, there's so many, again, layers to what this, this will look like. You know, we had a, a high unemployment rate um, for the African-American community in Dubuque. And what happens now that we have companies that are closing, um, those families that were already struggling, they don't have those social networks that others may have who have been here for a couple of generations. And what will that mean? Um, will that number be even higher um, and it is going to be across the board. Those struggles that we already had, they're now been compounded by some of the other issues that we have going on in the community. Um, and of course, that trickles down always to the families. If we cancel programs, which, you know, being a member of Leisure Services, I can't tell you how many conversations we have to try to figure out how we can keep the summer going for our most vulnerable, because when it's cut, that will be, it will be poor children that will suffer the most by those programs being cut this summer. Right, right. Well, and I just had a conversation with an educator this morning talking about, you know, the summer slide, but, you know, being extremely thoughtful about how that's been extended, you know, the mm -hmm. summer months um, will be extended because of COVID-19 and how do we make sure our kids, you know, when returning to school, and again, we don't know what the realities will even be in the fall, but how do we not let any kid fall through the cracks um, of our education? Um, you know, so um, a huge task in front of us. We've got some great school board members who I know are, um, you know, working through those conversations now and trying to figure that out. But I think one of the things that is pronounced is that digital divide as, as you described it and kids who don't have access to technology um, in the way affluent families may. Yes. I went to, um a local restaurant last week and I walked in and the parents were working, um, immigrant family. I'm assuming they had to work because they probably don't have the financial um, resources not to. And the children were in the restaurant learning. Um, and I thought about those families, whereas sitting at the table with mom and dad who could work from home were not an option. And so mom is balancing trying to provide for the family while the kids are having to, you know, balance between helping mom in the store and also learning. Um, and we need to understand, you know, we often look for the resilience um, in poor children, but I, that's bothersome to me because then why do they always have to be resilient? You know, why do we keep having to expect that they can navigate these spaces that we wouldn't ask of any other child? Um, and that for me is heartbreaking. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I want to take an opportunity and turn to some Facebook questions because there have been some. Okay. And um, I see Ferris is Ferris Muhammad, who used to serve in your role, is here with us. Hey, Ferris. Glad to see you. And he and Susie asked kind of a, a question similarly, but, um, you know, they're wanting to, to talk about support. Um, Ferris asks in particular, who has been most supportive um, during this time and where can more support come from? Um, and then Susie is trying to get at, you know, as someone who's um, attempting to be an ally 
for our minority communities, what does that look like? So, you know, who's, who's been supportive? What more do you need? What can allies do during this time? I believe truly in grassroots work. Yep. I believe that you don't have to have a position. You don't have to hold a title in order to do the work. Um, and so that might include that maybe they can't go to the park, but the neighbor's going to sit on the step and read a book to the kids in the evening. I think too often we look to leadership, and I, I, I say that because we can't be everything to everybody. Um, but I can do work on bluff. Um, that is apart from, from my job responsibilities. And I think that as a community, we have to really be more intentional about caring about the community. Um, I, it needs to look like the 50s and the 60s when communities were more engaged. And I know that that comes with um, a lot of challenges and conversations and things are very different. Um, but I think we've got to do better. Uh, and understanding um, that we all have a role to play mm -hmm. and so again if you're doing something um, for your own children that can be extended to another family member do that um, and, and and see what more we can bring you know when we started with the mask it was interesting to see the people who stepped up Lindsay to do what needed to be done in our community and then it was interesting to see those who kind of retreated and i won't take i don't want to negate fear i understand that but we're not in a position to not be able to offer ourselves um this social capital we speak so highly of to others and what that can look like mm -hmm. yes yeah and to come together as a community in that regard mm -hmm. yeah yeah well that's really those are helpful um responses as well and you know i think one of the other things as well keep us posted you know i know i'm i'm working on my end on a couple different things i um i'm joining the statewide human rights department um actually in a couple hours to have a, a conversation about um you know how do we um address the systemic issues you know as on a state level around these racial disparities and and coronavirus so um and we're going to we're going to have to make that um, a priority because, again, it's on Front Street now. You can see it. You can't pretend like these things, um, the health disparities don't exist. You can't pretend like education. You can't pretend anymore. It's there. If we ignore it at this point, then we have to say, OK, well, now we're trying. <laughs> we can we can kind of place blame a little bit. Well, and I think one of the difficult things for a lot of people is trying to wrap their brain around some of the systemic injustice and how there is system wide, you know, racial bias and, you know, in the way in which we um, operate as, you know, whether it's how we zone our city, um, whether it, where we put our schools and, you know, based on zoning, there's a number of systemic issues um, that, you know, happen. Um, in cities and in states and, you know, having, you know, being able to address those are vitally important to make sure that, you know, healthcare is accessible, education, you know, there's access to all in education and a number of things. Totally. So I know that you work, you know, on an advocacy, you know, to make sure these kids are <laughs> what need, um, you know, and certainly um, we all need to be able to be pushing for that. So I wanted to ask um, a question, you know, actually to our viewers if you have more questions keep on you know asking them in the live comment section um i want to transition the conversation just for a few minutes um into another major cultural event since since we have you on um jackie um we recently have um witnessed another horrifying incident where um, a young black man um, is murdered um in georgia um ahmed aubrey um can you tell you know, I want to ask you a kind of a personal question as it relates to that. Like, what was the the first thing that went through your mind um, when you learned of yet another horrific death and murder of this young man? I thought of his mom first because I'm a mom of two sons. I thought about what she felt like when she brought him home for the hospital. Um, because I know the excitement that comes with that. I thought about the hopes and the plans that she had for him. Um, and then I thought about the fact that we know that this idea of 
um, inclusion for many is an illusion, that it's not, um, it's not real, that I, it, it pains me to think that people judge my sons based on the color of their skin because they are no different than their white peers. They, I have one who wants a family and he wants to be an astronaut. I have another son who doesn't want a family and he wants to work for the FBI. They don't know the most part when they're going into the world that they're being judged, um, but I do. And so losing Ahmad has been the face of so many black males. And I don't care whether it is happening at the hands of a white man or at the hands of a black man. My heart hurts. And I'm worried that, I, I think I'm worried from a, a, a mental health, brain health standpoint of what we are telling our children. And again, what happens in the black community is internalized. So whether they are hearing the conversations in the home, whether they're on social media, they've got a world and, and we're talking a world right now because this, this virus has also, you know, certainly um, revealed some things internationally that they don't matter. And so I spend a considerable amount of my time as a mom having to focus on changing the narrative that seems to already be written for them. And that's for so many kids. Um, and while I've had really positive interactions in, in some of their experiences with others, I've had some negative as well. I didn't worry about, or I don't worry about so much with my daughters in the same way that I did with my sons. Mm -hmm. um, and how I look at all young men, um, we talk about what they wear when they walk out the house and how that's interpreted, what they say, um, what they like. Um, there just seems to be this love for the culture of black people without the love for the people. And that in itself is heartbreaking. Um, I'm still, and I don't think I'll ever be comfortable in that conversation of what that looks like, because there's always the feeling of it's going to happen again. And how do we move past that? Um, it makes someone so angry or think so little of someone that that life and, and so many lives like him could be lost. The, the pain is no different for me in 2020 as it was for my grandmother in the 60s, as it was for my great grandmother in the 20s, as it was for the period of enslavement in this country. It, it, it's still very painful. Yeah. Well, and I, you know, you talk about the kids who are internalizing these messages, whether they're hearing it on the news, whether they're hearing it from their peers or on social media. Um, how do we help kids as they're internalizing these messages? We've got to do some true man in the mirror um, conversations of what we're perpetuating, what we're saying, what we're doing. Um, and that happens in our homes. Mm -hmm. um, that happens in our community, in our schools, in government, in every entity. What are we telling them? School, I would say school and community play the largest role. In school, we've got to make sure that the um, those inequitable practices are being changed um, and that we are providing as much space and opportunity for all children, um, particularly children who live in urban areas or poor community where the needs just look very different. Mm -hmm. um, in the community, we have to, um, again, I'm 50 years old, so I'm gonna probably be a little old school here, but I do believe that if I see something that, um, is harmful that we speak, whether we're speaking to the children, to the parent, or to the person who may be perpetrating the behavior that's unacceptable. And again, it's different. It's a very different time now um, than it was growing up where people could say, you know, let me tell you what Jackie did, and, and my mom would accept that and say, okay, we, we changed that behavior. But we have to, again, be more intentional in how we are dealing with our kids. And we also have to understand that if they are acting out or, or showing uh, pushback, it's because they're living in a world that, again, is telling them that they don't matter. Um, we, we have to be, we, we got to do better about that. We, what we put out, you know, um, some of us that are in charge are putting out some of the very things that are keeping our children from, from being the productive individuals that they can be, that they want to be.
I don't think any child looks at themselves and say, I hope that I grow up and be absolutely worthless. That's not how this works. Right. Well, Jackie, um, you know, gosh, it's amazing how quickly it will move through a half an hour. We're coming up on the end of our time and the conversation really is beginning. Um, I have to say one of the things that I most respect about you is your prophetic voice in our community. You, um, continue to you know call things out and name things and and work for the common good and um you know and so i'm glad to you know have you on and sharing a bit about your story and we want to continue to support your efforts and be involved in them um you know so how can we do that can we google the mfc how do we how do we get involved yes okay we are um we are dedicated to the community the MFC is always looking for volunteers, um, and we're always looking for ways to engage. I don't believe that our service has to be within the walls, even our new walls of the MFC. We want to be engaged. If there's a way that we can be of service to the greater community, wherever that may take us, we want to see that happen. Um, and we want people to, again, um, find their space. You know, the whole thing with how we look at the MFC is that everyone has a space there, but we want people to find their space of where they can, they can be of service. Yeah. Well, thank you. Well, good. Okay. Thank so everybody you. find your space at the MFC and contribute to some really um, incredible thing in our community. Yes. Um, and you know, for those of you who are interested in having, um, continuing this conversation on Friday, um, we're going to specifically talk about the Marshallese community here in Dubuque and the disproportionate impact, um, the Levi family, we're gonna have an entire family on talking about the disproportionate impact in the Marshallese community uh, that coronavirus has had. And so another important conversation. Um, so hopefully you will tune in again on Friday at one o'clock and um, Jackie, thank you again for everything. Thank you, Lindsay. All right. Take care of each other, everyone. Yes, take care. All right, bye everyone. <laughs>